Welcome to a Sunday at the Library book talk at Coast Community Library in Point Arena, California. My name is Julia Lark and I'm very pleased to introduce Katie Taya, a historian and author of numerous local history books about Mendocino and Humboldt counties. She worked for many, many years as a middle school librarian as well as working at the well-known bookstore Gallery Bookshop in the town of Mendocino. Today she's going to be talking about her most recent book, An Eclectic History, An Eclectic History of Mendocino County. <laughs> um, and I think it would make a very nice gift. Uh, we're filming today during the COVID-19 pandemic, and so there is no audience who would have asked questions of the author. So I will welcome Katie with a very basic, comprehensive question. How did you come to write local history books? Hi folks, my name is Katie Taya, and I'm the author that's here today to share a little bit about my writing and the history of Mendocino County. Um, I am not a native of the county, but I married into a family in Conchie 45 years ago, and I've been here ever since. I've always been a fan of history, um, trained as a librarian, um, worked in the Mendocino Middle School, and worked part-time at Gallery Bookshop. And we were lacking in our little town of Conchie a history book. So in 1999, I did my first little book with the help of two middle school students called All Roads Lead to Comche. Little self-published number, but it has been selling ever since. And it basically tells you the true fact of the evolution of the little town of Comche. From that, my college background was in journalism. And I used to enjoy taking my kids on the skunk train from Fort Bragg to Willits. And the conductor would say, here was the town of Alpine, and a thousand people lived here. And you're looking at a grassy hillside, and you're going, well, why isn't there anything here now? What happened to Alpine? What was the story? So I wrote Rails Across the Noyo, a trackside history to the skunk train, which tells you about the history of Alpine, and mile by mile, all the little towns that were along the way. But to write about this book, you had to write about the development of the Mendocino Coast, and you had to write about the development of logging, because that's what the skunk train was moving, was logs at the time. So from that, I made the friendship of a photo historian in Ukiah named Bob Lee, who shared photographs. And I did the first of three books I did for Arcadia Publishing. And this one was called The Early Mendocino Coast, and it took you from the Sonoma County line to the Humboldt County line 100 years ago. Uh, and it was a fun book to do. Um, I enjoyed the research involved with it and learning about so many odd little facts about the county. The second book I did for Arcadia was for the centennial of Humboldt State University. And this was a campus history, again, 200 photographs, um, showing the evolution of Humboldt State. And it was my gift back to the university for the education that I got and my, humble, and my husband got and my daughter got, because all three of us are graduates of Humboldt State. From that, I did my third book for Arcadia. And when I did this one, I had a long conversation with the publishing house, and I said, are there really that many people that are interested in the fact that there were 40 railroads in the two counties? Yes. Come to find out, it's been one of my better selling books, and there were indeed people that were interested in the 40 little railroads, including ones from the Gualala to, to Bear Harbor. We had railroads, mm -hmm. and then all up through Humboldt County. But I was getting frustrated with Arcadia's publishing because they're very cookie cutter. You can't have a caption with more than 50 words in it under a picture. You can't have more than 10,000 words in the book. You can't have uh, more than 200 photographs in the one. book. So yeah. I decided that I was going to do it myself from all of the interesting stuff I had picked up doing these other books. So this is my latest pride and joy, and this is called An Eclectic History of Mendocino County. 
And I told the person that helped me with it, we better put a description of the word eclectic on the back. And the word eclectic means something drawn from a broad, diverse range of sources. And working on this book, because I'd done the previous books, I had squirreled away bits of information for years, never realizing that someday I might need to footnote something. So I made the decision early on. There were no footnotes in the thing. I wasn't going to footnote it. But if you go to the back, the bibliography is over 200 entries long. So if you really want more information about something, it's probably there. So I am going to share with you today some photographs that are in the book and some little tidbits of information you may have never known about Mendocino County history. And I'll start with this photograph out of the book. These are hop kilns. Um, excuse me, charcoal kilns, brain stutter, because hops are further down here. Um, charcoal kilns in Redwood Valley, because charcoal was a preferred uh, object for heating houses in the Bay Area and for industrial uses. The charcoal that came out of here was going to a munitions factory in San Francisco. But I don't know how many thousands of acres of oak trees ended up turning into charcoal in these charcoal kilns and being sent on the rail line down to the Bay Area. This was the asylum in Talmadge. You would not think of this as a major employment. Um, yeah. A major employment for uh, 800 people in the community. And there were, at times, 3 thousand people in this asylum. It had its own dairies, it had its own farms, it had its own um, animal raising facilities. Uh, it was a major employer for years and years and years. This building is long gone, but the city of 10,000 Buddhas bought the property and turned it into an educational institution. And if you ever have a chance to drive through um, when you're on the east side of Ukiah, it's an interesting place to look at. Transportation was always big in the county, and this was opening up of a new bridge over the Eel River, and everybody climbed on the bridge and showed up their photograph. They, they weren't done with the entry and exit roads yet, but they had the bridge done, and they wanted everybody to know about it, so they had a big celebration, and people climbed to the top of the bridge to share. This photograph I loved for the ingenuity of people. This is a firewood splitting machine. And this gentleman that invented this machine patented it. And there are all kinds of patent pictures and patent applications. Um, a Mr. Kamiski in the Ukiah Valley, who was very proud of his invention of a firewood splitting machine which to this day people need and use. My favorite bad guy was Black Bart. And Black Bart was my favorite bad guy because he robbed stagecoaches right and left, but he never killed anybody. Um, and wore a flower sack for his mask when he was busy robbing your stage. Robbed stages three or four places in Mendocino County over the years, and this was supposedly Black Bart Rock. There are lots of rocks around Willits that have been identified as Black Bart Rock and the rock that Black Bart would jump out behind to uh, rob the stagecoaches. And while I'm talking about that, I wanted a little, a little fun note about stagecoaches. One of the things I did in this book was I really liked the fact of writing more women into history. And I want to tell you about Delia Haskett. Delia Haskett's daddy was a stagecoach driver. And at age 16, she was driving the stage. And she would drive the stage from Ukiah to Willits in the dark by herself. And she thinks at one time she crossed paths with Black Bart. But she was, um, in 1861, um, she would, uh, was driving the stage. She would sing for her customers. When Wells Fargo was getting organized to recognize the um, stagecoach drivers and the people that had transported Wells Fargo goods, 
lo and behold, they discovered that there was a woman alive who had done it, and she was invited. She, had to, she was made the secretary of the group, but she was invited to share her stagecoach adventures and was one of the people we know very little about uh, or receive very little notice. This picture is, is not the world's greatest picture, but I don't think there's ever been a great picture of the place. When you talk about the transportation in Mendocino County, if you have lived in the county for a long time and driven north, outside of Piercy was a structure along this cliff called the Slab. Even Caltrans called it the Slab. And it was a perfectly legal two-lane wide piece of highway. It's just, it was sheer rock face on the inner lane and a drop off into the Yule River on the outer lane. I can remember as a college student going up to Humboldt in the 60s, watching people stop completely in the middle of the road here if they saw a log truck coming because they didn't believe the log truck could get by them, even though it's, it's perfectly legal lanes on the highway. They didn't believe the log truck could get by them. So they'd stop in their car and wait for the log truck to go by and then, and then go on down the road. You can actually go out and walk around on this piece of road now. It's a leftover. But it was infamous with Caltrans. It was called the slab. <laughs> when you talk about Mendocino County, you have to talk about logging mm -hmm. and the history, the history of logging. Um, and this was one of the camps, um, I believe this was up on Elk Creek, with a little railroad coming into camp with the cabins for the men. You would log everything you could reach in the area you were in, and then you'd extend the rail line another three miles further and start up the next canyon. So there were little towns and little places that existed with place names that aren't there anymore, but are still part of the lumber company land. This was the trestle at Jug Handle, at Jug Handle Creek up by Casper before the 1906 earthquake, Casper Lumber Company. When it fell down that. during 1906 earthquake, the community was outraged because somebody went out and threw a match into it and burn up all the wood that had fallen down. Lumber Company had all the wood in the world and they went back and rebuilt it within a year. It was, it was up and running again. But the size of some of these structures and the amount of wood that went into them, but again, they thought the wood was gonna last forever, so it wasn't a problem. Talking about redwoods, I made a list. When they first started doing red, uh, selling redwood, luckily a lot of the operations were photographed because you could not convince the people on the East Coast how big the trees were or what they could be used for. And so they would take photos of logging operations so that if somebody was going to the Pennsylvania Railroad and trying to convince them to buy redwood to put on the top of their Pullman cars so the sparks coming out of the chimney did not land on the top of your car and catch on fire, because redwood doesn't catch on fire, they'd have to take pictures with them and they'd also have to talk about what redwood could be used for. So I made a short list of what our redwood <laughs> off the coast here was used for. It was used for lumber, for pilings at docks, for shakes and shingles on houses, for paneling and wainscoting, for bridge timbers. It was used to build pianos, violins, harps, caskets, furniture, cigar boxes, fruit boxes, pencil stock, church pews, gun cases, and stadium seats were all uses of redwood I found. You, uh, you can use redwood to build silos and water tanks and pipes. You can build chemical vats, tanning vats, cheese vats, pipe, and ice cream tubs out of redwood. The Church of One Tree in Santa Rosa seats 500 people and was built from one tree, producing 78,000 board feet of lumber. Our railroad ties were one of the major operations here. And right here in Point Arena, you had on the Garcia River a flume that sent railroad ties miles and miles and miles down the river to, to Rollerville. But railroad ties were needed all over the world because they didn't rot. So our railroad ties went to Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, all, and all over the Pacific Basin, including Central America and South America. 
Um, redwood crates were made to move aircraft during World War II. And California grapes were kept in dried redwood dust to last months in refrigerated storage so you could have grapes on your table at Christmas in New York City. So that's just some of the things that the redwood was used for. <laughs> I always loved this picture because this was a great game. This was Casper. And from Casper, they would roll the logs. The logs would come off the train, and they would roll them down the hill into Casper Creek and the mill. And whenever they did that, you got a huge splash of water. You can't see it, but well, you can see the county bridge right here. The guys that were letting the log loose could, did it so frequently and could time it that they would wait for a car coming down the highway, drop the log into the water, and the spray would hit the car. This was their idea of entertainment while they were, while they were going by. Um, but take it, there were photographers that went down and spent hours just taking pictures of the splashes that came there. This one, this was either the Garcia River or the Gualala River, I forget. But this is an example of where you don't want your log, railroad log, locomotive engine. And what was amazing about it was, OK, you got a locomotive upside down in a river. How are you going to get it back out on the train track again? There was a machine invented by a man in Greenwood called a Lawson Flyer, a stationary steam, um, steam donkey on a railroad car with rigging. There's a sequence of like 20 pictures this day. They went down into the creek with one guy directing them, tied cables all over this rig and, and you know, very securely. The guy stood pulling levers on the Lawson Flyer picked the upside down train engine up, turned it right side up, did a 180, and put it on the rail car where it belonged. That was the technology they had, the control of their techno technology they had. I had mentioned hops earlier, because hop, this isn't the greatest picture, but it's what I could do. Hop picking was a, an industry that everybody could participate in when it was in the when it was growing in the Ukiah Valley. And hops came after a crop that you would not expect to be growing there, and that was tobacco. What was the Ukiah Valley doing growing tobacco in 1863? Well, 1863 was the middle of the Civil War, and there were not tobacco being grown in the American South at that point because it was a battlefield going on. People still wanted cigarettes, still wanted to smoke, and they realized that you could grow and dry in the Ukiah Valley tobacco. So they had a tobacco crop until the war was over and the South started growing tobacco cheaper, and then there was no more tobacco crop. But then hops came in. Hops grew for years and years. Everybody worked in the Ukiah Valley on the hops, but then they discovered they could grow hops cheaper in Washington. So then it became pears. And pears, they used to joke that they taught pear packing at Ukiah High School. And the school year did not start until the pear harvest was in. Um, and they were eternally grateful for the invention of canned fruit cocktail, because that needed lots of pears. The, uh, um, and from pears, it went to wine. And now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, it's gone from wine to marijuana. Um, when I did this book, I chose 150 years, from 1852 to 2002, because I did not want to get into the wine, grape, and marijuana discussions. I do do Back to the Land Hippies, but that's as close as I can. But these were everybody out picking hops. Hops are very itchy. Every time you see pictures of people picking pop hops, they've got long gloves on or long sleeves on, because they're itchy to hold. Now, here's a fun one for you. How many of you knew that Mendocino County had a Miss America? We actually had a Miss America from, that was born in Casper. And I, again, feisty women. I love this lady. She ran for Miss America for the first time in 1924, and she came in second. Well, there's no rule that back then that you couldn't run again. So she ran again the next year and did get elected Miss America. Cool. And um, she, she had been living in Oakland at, at this point, but she started out on the coast here. The great part of her story I love is, what do you do after you're Miss America? 
she was not successful in her movie career. She tried a movie or two, was it? But she'd been a secretary before. And so she got what I consider a really cool gig. Uh, Smith Corona hired her to tour the United States in a train with a portable typewriter. And she would come to a city and she would go to the biggest business store in the city and she would set up her Smith Corona and type <laughs> on a portable typewriter and you could come to the store and watch Miss America type a letter. Uh, but, but it was showing the value of portable typewriters, which were a new invention at the time. So she became the voice for portable typewriters. Um, another woman that I wanted to talk about, I don't have a picture of her, is one of my personal heroes. And this was a feisty little old lady named Edith Van Allen Murphy. And Edith Van Allen Murphy's goal in life was to transmit the knowledge of the Indian uses of native plants to the broader public. She did a book in the 1950s that is still regularly published, available in bookstores, from all of the research she did, she worked with Carl Purdy, who was one of the big plant collectors in Mendocino County. And the first time Carl Purdy saw her, she, you know, she was probably four foot ten or weighed ninety pounds or something like that. And he did not think that she would be a woman that you could send to Anthony Peak to collect Ceanothus or whatever. But he learned he was wrong. He hired her as a cook, and she ended up doing all the work. So he sent her out on expeditions then. But she had this long life going around collecting the plants in the county and documenting how the native populations used them. And I thought that was a notable accomplishment. Talking about logging again, they, again, these were the kinds of pictures that they would take um, back east to show people and explain to people that the tree was cut down one year, the underbrush was burned, the, the um, stuff was taken off, and then you put, it's supported underneath, so it, as the work's being done on it, it won't crack or fail or something like that. But the one guy with his ax, you know, there were a lot more people around, but for photographic purposes, one guy with an ax looked really good. This is another, um, this is on the headwaters of Big River. And they, on the, the relatively flat coastal areas, they adopted what were Great Lakes and East Coast logging practices, and that's called river drives. If you could get the logs to a river, you could float them to the coast. And you could float a log on Big River. You could go 40 miles up Big River and float a log to Mendocino, to the sawmills at Mendocino. Because they would let these dams fill up with water, they would float logs on top, and then they would open the dam, and the water would rush down the river, carrying the logs, hopefully, to the next dam, where the water would fill up, and they'd open it, or they'd blow it, and it would keep on going. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it stranded the logs. Sometimes the logs were stranded for years. <laughs> they don't want to talk about that. But this building these huge dams to control, this was referred to as this one, don't ask me why, was the Hell's Gate Dam. I don't know whether they considered it the gates of hell or what. <laughs> a sizable, a sizable undertaking. Um, another person I want to talk about, and I'm going to have to get a potato chip bag someplace, is Laura Scudder. And this is a great pointerina tie-in. Um, Laura Scudder founded a potato chip empire. And there's many of us that growing up probably had a bag of Laura Scudder potato chips. Laura Scudder started out in Ukiah, in a restaurant where Schatz Bakery is now, only they called it the Davenport Cafe, and taking care of the lawyers in the courthouse that would come over for lunch. And she was an intelligent woman. She'd been a trained woman. She was a nurse. And they said, you really ought to think about becoming a lawyer. We need a woman lawyer. You know, we, we would like to have this. Um, and you're hanging out with, these, with, with all these lawyers in the building all the time. So pregnant, she studied, went to Sacramento, and took her bar exam in Sacramento and passed and came back as a lawyer. Before she could start her practice, her husband decided they wanted to move to Southern California. He wanted to move to Southern California. Pick up, move to Southern California have a gas station with a little cafe next to it. 
and a little sort of, the same equivalent as a mini mart nowadays. And she started making potato chips at home at, you know, to serve in the restaurant or whatever. And then they started bagging them to sell to people. She would send home squares of wax paper with the mechanics at night whose wives would put two pieces of wax paper together, get their flat iron out, and melt the wax paper around the edge. They would put the potato chips inside, fold the lid, and she wrote the date, the freshness date, on the top. This is like, you know, 1920. And she's putting use-by dates on her bags of potato chips because she got peeved in, in their little market if they got stale potato chips. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. She had potato factories. She had people trying to buy her out. She was offered millions at one time for the company, and she wouldn't take it unless they guaranteed that every single employee that she had would still have a job. And they wouldn't, and she wouldn't sell the thing. Finally, you know, years later, she sold out. She had a newspaper column. She had a radio show in LA. Because she was a nurse, so she was good and knowledgeable on food and eating habits. But her entire career started in Ukiah in 1908 in a coffee shop next to the county courthouse. So there's your unusual woman fact for the day. This was, I like. I like this picture. This is how you got trees out of the woods before you had, uh, before you had steam and railroads. You had oxen. And if you notice, these oxen come in a variety of colors. And here's an interesting little story that I was never able to substantiate, but I know I read someplace, about the founding of Mendocino City. And they were sending the supplies to build the first sawmill on a ship up the coast. And overland were coming oxen and horses pulling wagons with supplies. And the sailors and the sea captain said, the entire north coast of California looks the same. How are we going to know that we have gotten to where Mendocino is going to be, Mendocino City is going to be? So Mr. Ford, who was going to be the superintendent of the mill, went out and bought white oxen only white oxen, not the polka dot ones here or anything like that, white ones. And at Mendocino City, at the headlands, on the hilltop that the high school is on now, he got there first, he took all the oxen, he tied them out on the hilltop, and he told the sea captain, sail up the coast and look for a herd of white oxen. And sure enough, here comes the boat up the coastline, and when it got to Mendocino, it could see the headland and see all the white oxen tied out on the headlands and knew they'd gotten to Mendocino City and they unloaded, got ready to unload. So oxen helped found Mendocino City. <laughs> when I talked about earlier about the logs being piled up behind the dams waiting for the water to come down, this is logs laying in decks in a stream bed waiting for the water to come from upstream to flow them down to the mill in Mendocino. I like this picture so much, it's the back of my book. And this is the Gualala River. And I liked it because you had the railroad bridge, you had the boats, and you had the steam locomotive all in one picture. And I think there's people in horseback on their carriages. But every, a, a picture that showed all aspects of transportation. And I joked when I did the book, I was going to have one picture of the hippie back to the land movement. And I remembered this picture and approached the photographer that and I knew took it. It is an overturned dump truck during Redwood summer. And the collection of hippies around it had written stumps suck on the bottom of the dump truck, the overturned dump truck. Many of these people are still there. When the book came out, I could go to these people and say, I have your photograph. Can and you put that forward? I, yeah. I have the Real photograph in the, in the book. Um, and they were very proud to be part of the history. And it was my one picture, other than a, than a houseboat, it was my one picture <laughs> of uh, the Back to the Land movement. It was an overturned dump truck. There was no rail transportation until 1913 to, get, to move timber to the Bay Area. So it was all done with shipping. 
And if you were sitting on this headlands with a pile of railroad ties or a pile of lumber, and the boat was out there, you were going to have to figure out how to get there. So they built elaborate chutes that would initially slide one board at a time down. And then they got sensible and figured out how to bundle the boards. Um, but there were about at least, I think I identified at least 30 shipping points. And you guys here on the South Coast had a lot of them. Um, to, I think this was Nip and Tuck, um, which is between here and Guala, but as a way to get the wood down to the Bay Area. San Francisco had this great habit of burning down frequently, so it really helped the lumber industry here. Now, the same thing happens when you need to move people. There was a wharf in Point Arena. There was a wharf in Albion. It was a small wharf in Little River. And there was one at Noyo and one at Westport. And otherwise, there, you couldn't walk out to the end of the wharf and get on the boat. So this is how you got out. You were either in a box, as these people are, or you sat on the trapeze. You had a good grip on the kids. And you were slid down to the deck of the boat or pulled from the deck of the boat up to the bluff. This woman was obviously showing off. She got out there on a Sunday with, on a dare from her boyfriend. And, you, know, <laughs> you climb up on the, I dare you to climb up on the rigging and I'll take your picture. Because you, women did not do that. Men did it all the time, but ladies did not get on the boat like that. But this was how you got on the boat. And my favorite story with this is I was on the school board in Mendocino from 1979 to 1987. And we always got out early on Friday afternoon. We got out like at 2 o'clock. And one, <clears throat> one conversation, discussion sometime, I said, why do we get out so early on Friday? Why is the school day out so early on Friday? And the older people <clears throat> looked around and said, well, the steamer left at 3 o'clock on Fridays. If you wanted to go to the Bay Area for the weekend, you had to be on the boat. You had to be slid down and on the deck of the boat by 3 o'clock. So they let school out at 2 o'clock on Fridays. And that's, it, it, you know, I go, the last boat left 30 years ago. And they go, well, yeah, that's true. And we changed the hours, and the kids did not get out early enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little one. Not so little one, but I love it. This is a rail line across the cliff. The, the cliff and this is elk. And this is how elk got their lumber out to their shipping point, was on this little bitty tiny railroad. But what they did, these men were so creative in using existing technologies. What's holding up this railroad track are the cripples and bents that are used in the construction of sailing vessels to support the sides of a sailing vessel. They turned them upside down. They took the same structural member turned it upside down, nailed it to the bluff, and put a train track on top of it. And that's how they got the stuff out to the easiest point to ship it the rest of the way out. And this picture I loved. This is my favorite kid picture because there isn't a kid in the world you show this picture to, and he doesn't go, how'd you get the horse in the log? <laughs> how did you get the horse in the hole in the log? Come to find out, they built a ramp up to the hole in the log. They blindfolded the horse and backed it backwards up into the hole, took the ramp down, got the photograph, put the ramp back up and let the horse out of the hole. Um, this was the kind of photograph that was used back east to convey to people how big the logs were. Yeah, can you push that one forward? <laughs> yeah. This Pretty is one of the ones big that are tree. <laughs> was very handy with the, with the photographs. Sometimes publishing companies just don't get it. Um, this is a rail car. This is a, a car that is adapted to run on a railroad, right? And they thought that the women were supposed to be what was in the picture, not the fact that the car was running on a railroad track. So they cut the, they, they cut the, railroad, the car off the bottom. Um, but if you lived in a woods camp and you wanted to come to town on the weekends, cool. you could get the company car and come into town and do your shopping or whatever and go home. This is another woods camp with another variation on the theme of how to get to town on Sunday afternoon. And almost every camp had 
some sort of a little jitney vehicle that they used when you didn't need to haul a log train or you didn't need to haul a flat car of loggers. You just needed to haul a few people. They had little vehicles like this. The, when, when engines were built, some of the engines were so tiny that they came, literally came in a box with a set of instructions, like Tinker Toys, and you put the engine together yourself. You had to build your own cab out of wood to keep the rain off of the guy that was running it. But this was a little, this is as simple as railroad technology gets. You have a steam engine, you have a gear, and you have cables to pull things. This was Rockport, and this was about as simple as it gets. Our technology in the woods developed engines that don't look, people look, they don't know about, people that have a standard sort of uh, Norman Rockwell vision of what a train looked like, you know. This doesn't look like their kind of train, you know. But they invented geared locomotives to deal with steep grades and twisty turny roads. And they were a very um, specialized form of transportation that was developed mainly for the logging industry. Okay, here's a couple of pictures. This is a steam. This is a steam yeah. donkey. Um, it was, it replaced animal power with machine powered, and it, they were run with wood for a long time because there was plenty of leftover wood around. But again, it provided the power to bring the logs, to drag the logs through the woods and bring them to the point that you were going to put them on a train. And this was an evolution. You talk about your chainsaws nowadays. This is what a chainsaw looked like when it started. The amount of kids that will come up and look at the picture and go, what is it? And I'd say, it's a chainsaw. And they go, that isn't a chainsaw. I go, yeah, that's what a chainsaw looked like back then. Um, but again, to get something big enough that you could slice the logs without one man standing there with a saw doing the work. <clears throat> this, was, this was the steel suspension yeah. bridge at Rockport. And this is the suspension part of it. This is an offshore rock at Rockport, 1879, I think. I don't have my, all my facts at my fingertips. But it was one of the biggest metal suspension bridges west of Mississippi at the time, specifically designed, again, with rail power to get out to a point where you could reach the ship. They were still doing the chutes and the cables out to the ship, but at least you could get further out. And uh, this was just a picture of, of of what trestles looked like after the 1906 earthquake, which was basically a pile of pickup sticks. <laughs> now, to end this, I have a couple of, I have some pictures of Native Americans and some just odds and ends of trivia. I fell in love with this picture. I mean, I, I thought that I knew the pictures of Native life in Mendocino County. This was a storage basket. This was an acorn storage basket, a granary basket. But I love the fact, hand woven by the native people, by the Pomos in Ukiah Valley, but I love the light shining through it. It obviously wasn't empty, it wasn't full at the time, and so the light shone through. And you've got it up off the ground so you don't have, you know, fewer animals trying to chew their way into it. But I thought that that was a, was a, and a little uh, thatched roof top on it to keep the rain off. But they could, they could build, they could make baskets that would fit on the end of your pinky, decorated baskets that you could balance on the end of your pinky. And the other extreme were baskets that were big enough that, um, you know, you could stick a couple of kids inside along with hundreds of pounds of acorns. Um, another one of my favorite people was Grace Carpenter Hudson. And Grace Carpenter Hudson was an artist in Ukiah um, who very much respected Native culture. Her husband did too. He was a, an anthropologist. 
Um, and she did a lot of the early, and I've got pictures of it here, but early photographs. But this is pretty much, this was typical of a brush house that people would have been living in in the Ukiah Valley. Beautiful big baskets that were being made, traditional hunting poses. This is, this is the work of Grace Carpenter Hudson. A lot of people complained that, it, that she made her pictures too simple and sweet. But even if she was making simple, sweet pictures, she was capturing the native culture at the time and preserving it for the rest of us. This is um, a grandchild playing again with a basket. Um, th this is hard to see, but it's a brush, a native brush shelter in the things, somebody doing a dance. Um, but pictures of the, the culture that existed at the time, they employed Native Americans and what were referred to then as Orientals in the family. More of the basket makers and the Dentalium, uh, a particular shell that was very popular with the, uh, on, with the uh, personal ornamentation. And then this was more of the baskets. Some of the redwood shelters that they used, and this, this picture was interesting. This is a standard Mendocino Coast Indian picture, but they're using the leftover slabs from the mill to make it, to, to prop up the stuff. This is mill waste that these houses have been made out of. And there's a, a map of the traditional um, grounds of the Pomo tribe. So those are some of the pictures I have that go along with what's in the book. And when I was, when I was working on the book um, and the introduction to the book, it was, it was interesting because I had all of the 100-year-old histories that had been done of the county. So you know you're going to do the natural world. And you know you're going to do the native people and the growth of business and the growth of towns and, and agriculture and stuff like this. So very proudly, I'm a friend of Bruce Anderson at the Anderson Valley Advertiser. Very proudly, when I was at my outline point, I went over to Bruce and I read my outline to him. And I read all the things I was going to cover and, you know, I'm going to do social movements and I'm going to do education and I'm going to do transportation. And he's listening to me and he goes, where are the sports? And heaven forbid, as a woman, I had forgotten about the role that sports play in the county. And come to learn that we had uh, Archie Vaughn, who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame, lived in Ukiah. And uh, I found a lot more about the sports history that I ever knew. Crime and Punishment. And then I did a chapter called Wanderers. I did a chapter called Famous Folks. And I did Parks, Roadside Attractions, and Trivia. Um, one, one of my favorite wanderers was Winston Churchill. How many of you knew that Winston Churchill was wandering through Mendocino County? in 1927 um, on a tour on the coast and he's in a motorcade um, was in in between important jobs in Britain it's in a motorcade coming down from Humboldt County he comes into Mendocino County on what was the struggling beginning of the Redwood Highway and he's driving an open touring car so he's got the canvas duster on and the hat you know and the goggles and he's driving they pull up in front of the Van Hotel, which was the fanciest place in Willits at the time, and he gets out to go in, and the two or three cars that are traveling with him all pull up. They take one look at him, assume he is the hired driver, and give him a room in the basement of the hotel, which he goes down to look at. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the entourage walks in and goes, where's Diplomat Churchill? And they go, what do you mean? And they go, the first guy that walked through the door, and they go, hmm. <laughs> And moved him up to the best suite in the, in the hotel. But, you know, finding, finding little tidbit, tidbits of, of stuff like that in people that have gone through the uh, county. Um, another one I love is on that same Redwood Highway. When they decided to build the Redwood Highway, the transportation department, it was, oh boy, we're going to have this. The highway's like Highway 99 in the Central Valley. That was to move business and crops and stuff like that. But they were going to build this highway designed for tourists. So they get started on it in the teens, 19 teens. And this thing called World War I starts. And all the able-bodied young boys are packed off to Europe to go fight the war. So the road builders are left looking around going, we've got this commitment to building roads. What are we going to do? And they looked around and said, well, where can we get people? And they looked at San Quentin.
and here's all these guys locked up in San Quentin. So if you were a trustee, if you had a good record, you could arrange to be in a crew that was sent, I think it was 10 guys, a guard, and a cook. And you were put at the end of the highway. They would sail them up to Westport, drive them to Leggett, and then have them start on the, on the work on the highway. And crew after crew of San Quentin inmates built the Redwood Highway during 1917 because they couldn't get soldiers anyplace else. It was the crazy little tidbits of stuff like that that I loved doing the book. If you go to Mendocino City now, you go into the center of Mendocino, and there is an entire city block in the center of Mendocino City that is empty. It's got a post office on one corner of it, like two houses. It's a big Baptist church on the corner. Big, empty lot. And this happened all the time when I worked in a bookstore. People would come in and go, how come there are no houses on the lot, big lot, center of town? And I said, well, let me tell you. I said, there was a time when Mendocino City was the biggest place in Mendocino County. It was far bigger than Ukiah. Mendocino City wanted to get to be the county seat. And so the landowner offered an entire city block that was going to be where the county courthouse was going to go when it was moved from Ukiah to Mendocino, because Mendocino was more important than Ukiah. Didn't happen, but the block stayed there empty as community property, and to this day there's, there's no building on it. It's called Hyder Field, and it's there in the middle of Mendocino, and that's where we hoped the county courthouse was going to be. <laughs> So there are so many other things. I'll, I'll end with talking with two things, <clears throat> uh, because one of them affects the, the South Coast here. Uh, the first people that went up the coast was a Hudson Bay Trappers group in 1832, coming up from Fort Ross. And we don't think about the fact that there might have been a beaver population here at one time. There was, what Hudson Bay Company eventually discovered is that if you go through and you trap all the beavers, there's nothing left to come back to a year later or two years later or three years later. But this was a discovery tour. And they traveled with a group of about 100 people, had good relations with the natives they met all the way, and journaled every step that they took, they kept journals of, which of course somebody found later, documented, you know, we have them to refer to now. But they used a word in their description of coming up from Fort Ross when they were coming up and talking about the, the land that they were looking at. And we were very brushy then, and they said it was very thickety. There were thickets every place that they had to go through, and it was a very thickety journal, and I, I thought that was a good word. I liked the <laughs> thickety. The other one is about a piece of wildlife that we still have in the county that is 40, 50, 60 years old now, I guess. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to go over Or Springs Road or um, the road between Ukiah and Willits, at a particular time of the day or the evening, you may have the chance to see herds of white deer. These are European fallow deer. There are three herds of them in different places in the county. One's on Orr Springs Road, um, one's around Leonard Lake, I think, and um, another one more up towards Leggett. But what was amazing was that Charles Howard, that owned the racehorse Seabiscuit, at the Golden, what is now the Golden Rule Ranch, was a good friend of William Randolph Hearst's, and he was down visiting at San Simeon, which was Hearst's um, palatial abode along the side of the Pacific Ocean. And Hearst had all kinds of unusual wildlife, including white deer wandering around. So Mr. Howard went to Hearst and said, can I buy some of your white deer? So in 1959, he bought 10 of them, and he put them in a rail car because he had a siding at his at his ranch and brought up the uh, group of white deer, turned them loose. Turns out they don't interbreed with the other deer. And so 40 years later, no, 40, yeah, 60, 40, 60 years later, there are still three herds of white deer that Fish and Game keeps track of. 
When my kids were growing up, they called them fog deer because they looked like they were fog. You can see them really easily against green grass, but otherwise they're, they're hard to see. There are people that have lived in Mendocino County their entire lives and never seen the, the deer, but they know they're out there. They've heard about it. It's like finding white redwood. You know, If you know where it is, you can find it. <laughs> so anyway, there's all kinds of trivia and fun little things in here. Um, I'm happy to say that 4 a Frog in Gualala, um has a stock of these books available right now. Gallery Bookshop in Mendocino, the museums, things like that. So if you're interested in knowing more odd little facts about Mendocino County, it's in here in this book, and I hope you enjoy it. And we'll have a copy at the library. And the library has a copy because I donated <laughs> a copy to the library. <laughs> thank you very much, folks. Well, thank you, Katie. Appreciate you coming today.